I hope this evening finds all of you within the Calvary Baptist Church family doing well and glad to be back with you this evening. Uh, in just a few moments, we'll be sharing from God's Word, but before we do that, I'd just like to give you some uh, new prayer requests, if I may. Uh, first of all, we need to begin praying for the Kiner's grandson, Jasper, who's going to be having pharyngeal flap surgery uh, on either June the 15th or 16th. I've got uh, conflicting information on that and was unable to get a hold of Brother Bob this morning, but it's either going to be on June the 15th or the 16th. <clears throat> and so please uh, start praying for this young man right now. He's been through a lot in his young life, and uh, we're just praying for great success in regard to the surgery. Also, Tina Hopper has asked us to pray for the father of her daughter-in-law, Angela, uh, the dad's name, and we've requ requested prayer for him before, but his name is Charles Nicodem, uh, N-I-C-K-A-D-A-M. And, of course, he's been in a bad way physically. Uh, he is back in the hospital and not doing well. And uh, <clears throat> so... Charles could be living in the last days of his life. Uh, the urgent need at this particular point is that we're very unsure about his spiritual condition. He is probably an unsaved man and needs to be converted before he passes out of this life. So please pray for Charles. And then we're all very much aware of the rioting and Antifa uh, activities that have been going on around the nation and even in the, in the city of Richmond. And uh, we've been asked to pray specifically for uh, the Chick-fil-A at the Willow Lawn location where uh, brother Pastor Bob Eshelman works and also Zach Souls. And uh, so... Uh, the danger is not over there, uh, not over yet, so be praying for, for their safety. Uh, we would like to pray for the policemen within our church as well. I Immediately, uh, Daniel Byram and David Grace come to mind. And so, pray for God's blessing uh, upon their ministry <clears throat> to the community, if you would. And Wanda Hudson, in the same regard, has asked us to pray for her daughter, Melanie, and her son-in-law, Warren Younts. Uh, they work in the Bank of America building downtown. And uh, so again, let's pray for their protection during this time. I, I would like to say that um, if what we've been going through with this pandemic and uh, now the riots within the streets of our nation, if this is not God's wake-up call, then I don't know what else it could be. Um, we as the people of God can become rather passive and numb to the preaching of the Word of God. And every time God... Uh, allows us to sit under the preaching of the Word of God. He's reaching out to us to change and become more like Christ. And I believe that's God's desire for us right now. I think we need to accept the blame where it is due that our nation is in the mess that is in to a large extent because because of the lack of God's people to stand up and to be involved where they need to be involved. And I, I think um, you have a great opportunity right now with the people that you work with, with your friends and family, uh, an opportunity to let them know that 
they need to get right with God because we don't ultimately know where all this is going, but things do not look good in America right now. And uh, things could immediately become considerably worse. I'm not an alarmist. I'm not afraid because my faith is in the Lord. But um, God's been speaking to me, people of God, and I think it's time for us to get more serious uh, than ever before in our relationship with God. What do you What do you think uh, out there? I mean, how, how do you feel about all of this? Uh, I think we need to wake up and be salt and light and really begin to pray for revival. We need it desperately. And at this time in America, God's people need to be heard from. And so I want to encourage you just to take your stand for the Lord Jesus Christ and also to draw closer in your relationship with him that God may bless us in our ministry to the unsaved. Thank you very much. And uh, now we'll take this time to transition to our Bible study time. Uh, may God bless you. I would like to share with you once again a Bible verse that had a tremendous impact on American history and that concerns the uh, early settlement there in Jamestown. The verse I would like to uh, share with you is 2 Thessalonians 3.10. It says, for even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. French explorers notwithstanding, the Spanish Empire dominated the Americas for a hundred years, uh, shipping back enough gold to make Spain the richest nation on earth. But England had no intention of being left out. Uh, Sir Walter Raleigh, journeyed to the New World and staked out a portion of land he named Virginia for England's virgin Queen Elizabeth. His efforts faltered, however, but after Elizabeth's death, her nephew James I granted a charter for an attempt led by Captain Christopher Newport. The names King James and uh, Christopher Newport are interesting because uh, that's where the names uh, for Jamestown and Newport News came from. Anyway, on April the 26th, 1607, three ships arrived in the Chesapeake Bay and within a few weeks, the settlers established the colony of Jamestown up the James River from the current site of Newport News. About that same time, King James also authorized a new version of the Bible, uh, lending his name on uh, two legacies, Jamestown and the King James Bible. The Jamestown venture wasn't uh, a spiritual enter enterprise, but a commercial endeavor. Unlike the pilgrims and Puritans who would cross the Atlantic a few years later to settle areas farther north, there was little Christian spirit at Jamestown. Consequently, things didn't go well. The community was splintered by conflict, greed, da uh, drought, and disease. No strong leader emerged, and the settlers bickered like children. The water from the James River made them sick, and they were tormented by mosquitoes and malaria. Uh, they suffered attacks as well from local indigenous tribes. All told, half the settlers perished during the summer and fall of 1607. A single pastor was present. His name was Reverend Robert Hunt. On June the 21st, 1607, he presided over the first communion service in British America. It was held under a sail suspended between trees and the pulpit was a board nailed between uh, two trees. Hunt appealed for a spirit of unity and pointed out that the very sacrament of communion represented the urgency of living in harmony. Hunt's voice of reason didn't last long. 
He died about the time a primitive chapel, chapel was constructed and was buried under its floor. After Hunt's death, Jamestown again deteriorated into chaos, splintered by weak leadership and, and just plain laziness. Uh, many settlers there refused to do any kind of manual labor. They had come to dig for gold, but they had no intention of digging for crops. And to make matters worse, a fire broke out and destroyed many of their huts and houses. And once again, it looked as if the colony would perish. But on September the 10th, 1608, Captain John Smith became leader of the Jamestown community. Appalled by the idleness of some of the settlers, Captain Smith made it an important ruling based on 2 Thessalonians 3.10. Again, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. He told, and, and with that, he told them, quote, that their late experience and misery were sufficient to persuade everyone to mend his ways, that they must not think that either his pains or the purses of their adventures at home would forever maintain them in sloth and idleness, that he knew that many deserved more honor and a better reward than was yet to be had, but that far, but that far the greatest part of them must be more industrious or starved, that it was not reasonable that the labors of 30 or 40 honest and industrious men should be consumed to maintain 150 loiterers, that therefore everyone that would not work should not eat. People grudgingly went to work. The death rate dropped. Supply ships arrived as well. A, a, a well was dug, crops were grown, and the colony began to slowly establish a foothold. Although Jamestown still faced many difficult days, an important precedent had been set in the early history of America, the biblical principle of hard work. When Paul wrote to the Thessalonians in the first century, he knew some of them were wasting their time and simply waiting uh, around for Christ to return to earth. In 1 Thessalonians 3, he addressed the same issue of idleness, reminding them that when he visited the city, he didn't sponge off the Christians there, but he worked with the labor and toil, you know, day and night. And he did so that he would not be a, a burden under the folks there, as he wrote in 1 Thessalonians 3 a. And then he proceeded to lay down the principle that became so important to the mindset of America. If any would not work, neither should he eat. Jamestown became the first permanent English settlement in North America. Smith's knowledge of a single principled verse of scripture, 2 Thessalonians 3.10 ushered in a work ethic that has over the centuries created the most industrious and productive nation in history. Tonight for our devotional, I would like to remind us all of a particular point concerning prayer that will be of great interest to us uh, if we are indeed interested in effectual prayer. The text is taken from James chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. And there we read, Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your own lust. The point I would like to make tonight is simply this. If you pray wrongly, you can be sure your prayers will not be answered. We've all encountered moments in our spiritual lives when we prayed with no results. 
apparently the people to whom James was writing uh, this epistle were having the same experience. Just as you have probably asked yourself at one time or another, it appears that these believers were also asking, why aren't our prayers being answered? We can surmise that they were asking this question because James provided an answer in James chapter 4, verse 3. He said, Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss. The Greek word for amiss is kakos, which describes something that is bad or wrong. As James uses it, uses it in this verse, it, de it, de it depicts a person who is asking wrongly, badly, or inappropriately. You could say that this person is simply not hitting the mark in his request. Although he, he may pray with the greatest fervor, he's not hitting the target with what he's asking. This person is apparently asking God to do something that is not in agreement with his word. Therefore, regardless of how long or how passionately the person asks, God will not answer his request with a positive answer because it's not in agreement with the word. Or perhaps the person in question uh, is asking for the right thing, but because he's so fretful and filled with fear and anxiety, he doesn't ask in faith. Rather than praying from a position of faith, he cries out to the Lord in fear and anxiety and fear doesn't move God and does not impress God. There's one thing that does, however, and that is faith. Hence, although this person may be asking for the right thing, he's asking with a wrong spirit. Thus, he is asking badly or inappropriately. He's asking amiss. This means what we ask and how we ask are both of vital importance if we're going to get our prayers answered. So the literal thought of this verse is simply this. You ask and receive not because you are asking wrongly, badly, or inappropriately. When I was younger in the Lord, I made the mistake of asking things wrongly when I prayed. I was young in the Lord. I was learning. And I think at times my intentions were right, but my prayers were not in agreement with the truths revealed in the Bible. I was praying about what I wanted more so than what God wanted for me. And there were other moments when I finally got my prayers in agreement with the word of God, but I was so motivated by anxiety and fear that I couldn't ask in faith. And consumed with worry, I, I remember there were a couple of times where I pounded the floor as I prayed, crying out for God to move on my behalf. But because I was so filled with fear regarding the situation that I was praying about, all my pounding and crying didn't do a bit of good. I was praying with the wrong spirit. I was praying out of fear rather than out of faith. So all of that effort resulted only in a sore throat. Have you ever had the experience of asking the right thing in the wrong way? Praying scripturally and in faith is essential if you want your request to be answered positively. Uh, John wrote in 1 John 5, 14, <clears throat> and this is, listen carefully, and this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. I need to emphasize that again. This is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us, period. The word confidence in the Greek is parousia, and 
it obviously, as I said, describes confidence, but also boldness or assurance. It pictures a person so confident that when he speaks, he has no doubt about what he is saying. He knows that what he is saying is correct or appropriate. Therefore, he becomes very bold in the asking. In the context of prayer, this word presents the picture of a believer who is so confident he is right in what he is asking that he asks unashamedly and confidently. Well, what can give you this confidence, this kind of confidence? The verse goes on to tell us if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. So when you know God's will and you ask him to do something that is in agreement with his will, you can be 100% sure that God will hear you and that your request will be positively answered. That may not be answered in the way you would like for it to be answered, but again, what I'm saying is that you come to him in confidence, praying in God's will, that request will be positively heard and answered by God. This means you have solid ground on which to stand as you pray in agreement with the revealed will of God, the Bible. Since your request is in agreement, with what God has already revealed in his word, you know you can be bold when you make your request. There is no need for you to pray out of fear and anxiety either. Let's be done with that. Just, so to speak, quiet down and let the word of God fill you with peace. Meditate long upon the word of God to prepare your heart for prayer and then ask in faith, 1 John 5, 14 guarantees that if you ask anything that is in agreement with his will, again, God will hear you. In fact, verse 15 goes on to promise you, and if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. We know it. Knowing what to pray and how to pray is vitally important. So always keep this in mind as you get ready to make your request known to God. God listens for his word and he responds to faith. When he hears his word prayed from a heart of faith, he is compelled to act. And the success of your prayer life is up to you, friends. So don't ask amiss when you pray. Make sure you are asking correctly and in an appropriate spirit of faith. As you learn to pray in line with God's word from the heart, filled with faith, the answers you seek will manifest in your life more quickly and more fully than ever before. May God bless the hearing of the word of God to your heart tonight, because this can make what I've talked about tonight, a tremendous difference in our lives going forward. God bless you.